Okay, we're going to get started. Just sit right in the front row. Just right in the I want to thank you all for coming. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier chair here at CSIS. I want to welcome you to the 2018 Global Development Forum. Um, I also am the director of the project for U.S. Leadership and Development. I have two quick administrative announcements before we get started. First, I'd like everyone to silence their cell phones and other noisemakers, please, if you would. Uh, and second, in case of an emergency, I'll be your designated security officer. Please follow me as I lead everyone out through the exit here in the back or down the stairs. Um, our meeting place will be the National Geographic Museum on the 17th Street, and you have some uh, safety information on, in the brochure. Dr. Hamry, who's here, always promises popsicles if, if there is such a thing. So I, we promise popsicles if there is such a thing. Maybe not in this rain, but, but I, I think you get the idea. I want to thank my friends at Team Chevron. Uh, I'm particularly grateful to Joanna Nesseth and also uh, Zamira, uh, who's come a long way to be with us. Uh, but it, we couldn't do this without Chevron. They've really helped us um, do great things here at CSIS, and it's been a wonderful and constructive partnership. I'm very, very grateful. Uh, this is our fourth year doing this uh, Global Development Forum. I think it's become a thing to use the, the parlance, uh, and, I'm, and that's directly a result of our partnership with Chevron. Thank you very, very much. But I also need to thank my colleagues here at CSIS, uh, Jenna Santoro, Chris Metzger, Sundar, uh, Errol, and many others who worked very, very hard to make this possible. So thank you all very, very much. Okay, so uh, we're going to play a movie, a video, to get this started, and then I'm going to call up Dr. Hamry um, to make some words of welcome. So can we play the movie, please? Over the past 30 years, the developing world has undergone revolutionary changes. Dozens of countries are following the path of South Korea, where more people are now part of the middle class. This new middle class population works regularly and lives in more urban areas than any other time in history. These countries want a new and different partnership with the United States based on trade and investment. They also want access to science, technology, and innovation. At the same time, fragile and conflict-ridden states remain. They are currently home to about one in five people on the planet and will have as many as four-fifths of the world's poor by 2035. They face many of the most pressing security threats, global pandemics, and forced migration. Currently, only a few hundred billion dollars are available globally for foreign aid. In order to confront these challenges, these countries will require not billions, but trillions of dollars while the world needs significant amounts of traditional foreign aid for the next several decades, what needs to change is how we use and leverage that foreign assistance. We must also revisit the value of local tax collections, the power of local savings, and local capital markets. We should also consider the critical role of private sector investment, the emerging role of global pensions, sovereign wealth funds, and more. By expanding on our conventional assistance tools, we can achieve better governance, higher economic growth, and address the skills and infrastructure gaps in developing countries. So how do we go from billions to trillions? We can unleash the power of the private sector. With nearly 80% of the world's markets living in developing countries, foreign aid can help local governments create incentives to bring in businesses. Developing countries can mobilize their citizens to expand their tax base. Citizens are more willing to pay taxes to ensure security, education, and infrastructure. In the early 2000s, El Salvador struggled to recover from civil conflict and a major earthquake. USAID announced in 2004 that it would implement reform that would broaden El Salvador's tax base and increase its tax collections. By 2010, with a match from the El Salvadorian government, the country reaped an additional $1.5 billion to spend on education, infrastructure, and healthcare. Finally, developing countries can reform their financial institutions. After the 1997 Asian financial crisis hit Indonesia, the government sought aggressive capital market reforms with the help of the Asian Development Bank. This fund helped establish more public-private partnerships and created surpluses that could then be used for more development. Today, Indonesia is on its way to mobilize $400 billion for infrastructure projects. By focusing on private sector investments, we can go from billions to trillions to address some of the big challenges of our time.
good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. My name is John Hamry, uh, and I am like the warm-up act waiting for Jay Leno to arrive. Uh, Senator Coons is in town. We know his train has arrived, and we know he's in traffic along the way. Unfortunately, that means you're going to listen to me for just a few minutes. And, uh, but I do want to share with you the inspiration that's behind our work uh, here, and I want to especially say thank you to Dan Rundy and his team. Uh, it started with a, a, an observation about the way the world was in Washington was structured when it came to the terms of development. It, it tended to be, it, uh, you know, the town tended to be narrowly divided around, do you like USAID or do you hate them? You know, it was, it was a very limited debate and it, it tended to be about kind of, partisan totemic attitudes about a, a, a government institution. And we were losing track of what it was that we were all about. What, what is the enterprise that we're involved with? Well, we're, we started with a very simple formulation. Um, we're after building healthier individuals, healthier communities, healthier countries. And that's, that's re really what it's about. Let's just go with that limited formulation. Now, why is that not an agenda that both conservatives and liberals could embrace? They can. Why is that not an agenda that the business community and the NGO community could embrace? Let's formulate this problem in a way where we can all join together and solve it together. And then that led to this, uh, this uh, discovery, for me, discovery. Uh, many of my colleagues here have uh, such deep expertise and knowledge, but I don't. Uh, I come from a very limited background. It was primarily a defense background. And started to realize the depth of capacity that we have to draw on. And it isn't just inside the government. But I also know from having been a government guy for 25 years that it's very hard for the government to understand how the private sector functions. The com how, what are their incentives? What are, the, what are the constraints that they live with? What are the ways in which you can mobilize shared purpose? And um, this led to this development of this program and ultimately the, the grounding of the Global Development Forum. It did take finding an intellectual partner in Chevron. Chevron, because of their own experiences, uh, realized that there was a different way to think about this problem. And if I might, uh, Johanna, this, this stems back to a time when Chevron won a major oil concession in uh, Angola. And the president of Angola said, uh, they said, well, we'd like to also give you a hospital, just to thank you. And he said, no, I don't want a hospital. I want you to rebuild my country. And he said, right, uh, we're going to do that. And, but fortunately, we had a very wise ambassador uh, in Angola at the time. He said, well, let's work on this together. And Chevron discovered, and many other corporations have now discovered, that um, you know, if you are attentive to your society where you work, if you're interested in the well-being of the society, the people that work for you, if you are interested in the environment where you operate, your business gets better. Absentee rates drop among employees. It's much easier to find new recruits for your employment. You, vandalism on your facilities drops to nothing. When all of a sudden they look at a company and see it being a welcome partner on the stage, attitudes change. Chevron learned this in real life. And all of a sudden they started to say, this is a larger model for us. This is a larger model for us. And as this video highlighted, you know, governments can mobilize 10, 20, 30 billion dollars, but supply chain is going to be trillions, measured in trillions of dollars. So how do we transition, as Dan is fond of saying, how do we transition from aid to trade? How do we think about mobilizing this enormous capacity in the private sector to do great good? Now there was a, I think it was about 15 years ago, maybe 18 years ago, the World Bank did a remarkable study. Uh, many of you probably here have read it. This was a study trying to account for why are nations wealthy? You know, is it because of abundant natural resources, uh, you know, rich fishery stocks, great forest reserves, a, you know, a very temperate climate, great place to raise agricultural products? 
Or is it about man-made resources, factories, transportation networks, things that let you make things that you can sell? Is it, a, is it the product of, of human creation? Or is it, and they had a third category, it was called intangible resources. And what were the intangible resources? Well, they were things like uh, the quality of an education system, the uh, uh, efficiency and sense of fairness in a judicial system, the uh, stability of a currency, the predictability of, uh, uh, and fairness of markets. You know, so it, it had this category that they called intangible resources. And then they did a large econometric regression analysis and what the results were astounding. Um, overwhelmingly, by a factor of two to one, the most powerful determinant of the wealth of nations were these intangible resources. And then, so if you stop and think about it, uh, stable currencies, efficient markets, um, a, an efficient and fair judicial system, quality education. Every one of these are the product of good government. Every one is a product of good government. This is what's trying to inform the work that we're doing with, with Dan. It's, there is an indispensable role. The, the profit-seeking private sector is not going to be credible to build a judicial system. They need it. It's not going to be credible to build an education system. They can augment it. But there, so there's a very crucial and important role that the government plays and that USAID plays, the development agencies plays, which is to help with this, this essential infrastructure of progress. And then the question is, is how do we then create the positive incentives with the private sector so that we get takeoff? And it's, and there has been takeoff. I think, Dan, the data wasn't on this video, but I remember seeing it from an earlier time. We've got, what, how many, 40 or 50 countries that 40 years ago were in the broken, poor state with no hope. And they've now moved up into sustainable growth category. You know, we still have, sadly, a lot of countries that are struggling where there is not, there has not been progress, the classic development model. You know, so it's not that the world has gone away for the traditional development model, that, but we have to start complementing that with new ideas. And that's what we're going to explore today. We're going to explore today what are these new ideas, uh, especially in the world of uh, development finance. It's going to be a major, major focus for the day. So uh, it's going to be a rich, um, uh, a rich morning, a rich afternoon. My thanks to Chevron for again letting it be possible for us to have this forum. And in a few minutes, I'm, my, my little speech didn't last long enough uh, because Senator Kuhn hasn't arrived yet, but he will be here shortly. So I would suggest everyone just stay where you are and in a few minutes we'll escort him up to the stage and you get to hear something for real. Thank you all for coming today.
Okay. So I'm going to use the uh, I'm going to use the uh, the American idiom. I'm going to call an audible. So I'm going to ask the plenary panelists to come up. So I'm looking for Zamira. I'm looking for Laura. Uh, I'm looking for my friend Donna Sims Wilson. Uh, I'm looking for Nadia Shadlow. Um, and um, I know the Minister of Denmark is going to be joining us as well. But I'm gonna, we're going to go ahead and get started. When the senator comes, we'll hit the pause button. We'll make some remarks and then leave. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. started. Okay, so we, we're, we're going to be having, the conversation today is about from billions to trillions. And so what's been recognized is that, we, you saw the movie, we can't, we can't achieve all that needs to be achieved, whether it's infrastructure, or whether it's water, or whether it's education with foreign assistance alone. And, but we also need the private sector, but we need government, we need good governance, we need rule of law, we need clear rules of the game. We talk about there's, there's trillions of dollars in an infrastructure gap in the world. And so as a result of that, um, there's been a shift starting with the Addis Ababa Financing for Development Conference in 2015. If you have trouble sleeping at night, you can read the Addis Ababa 2015 communique. But it basically says that foreign assistance, it was a major shift in the international system saying that foreign assistance wasn't just the central driver of development, it was a catalyst. And so that's an important shift. Uh, it's still important. So this is not to say we still don't need foreign assistance. We still need foreign assistance, but we need other forms of resources, taxes, local savings, investment. And we also need development finance. And I think we're going to hear a little bit about that today. I think that's going to be one of the other underlying themes today as well. So um, I'm really glad we have, a, we have a quorum on our panel and several other panelists are going to be joining us shortly. I, I, what is up with the, the DC traffic, by the way? <laughs> but, uh, we're, and, but we're going to get started. But I think I'm very, very happy that my friend Dr. Nadia Shadlow is with us. So Dr. Shadlow is the Deputy National Security Advisor at the White House. She's really one of the smartest people I know and is really um, a very hardworking and earnest public servant. And the country is very, very fortunate to have had Dr. Shadlow uh, serving in the White House for the last year. I know you're going to be leaving the, the job shortly. Yeah. So thank you for doing this, Dr. Shallow. But uh, Dr. Shallow quarterbacked the national security strategy, and I bet many of you have read it. Uh, and I wanted Dr. Shadlow to talk a little bit about, I wanted Dr. Shadlow to be on this, the panel because I wanted her to provide a little bit of context for some of the thinking that uh, how the US government thinks about these issues. Um, and one of the things I found very interesting in the National Security Strategy, I think it's twice is referenced a new development finance institution, is twice referenced in the National Security Strategy. So Dr. Shadow, thanks for being here. Thanks, Dan. I'm, I really appreciate being here. And it's, it's, I feel like I'm coming home when I come back to CSIS. And um, I'm grateful for the opportunity and also for the work that you and your team, Dan's team especially, has done in thinking about how to modernize foreign assistance, uh, which you've really been a leader at um, over the years. So thank you. Um, so I thought today I'll just give you a brief overview of the National Security Strategy and some of the points that it makes about this subject. Many of you may have read it. Others who are waking up in the middle of the night and want to read it uh, can find it on, on, on the web, and it's there. Um, essentially, the strategy begins with identifying America's four core national interests. Uh, we described how we will protect the homeland, promote American <coughs> prosperity, preserve peace through strength, and advance American influence. And in that fourth pillar of advanced American influence is where many of the issues, I think, of most interest to this audience, um, you'll find the issues that you care about, talking about foreign assistance, about multinational uh, institutions, and championing American values. As a strategy, um, uh, the strategy essentially places development within the strategic context of aligning it with America's interests and America's values. As we developed the strategy, we spent a lot of time talking to outside experts, to people like Dan and others, to capture many of the good ideas about how we should be modernizing and updating our foreign assistance approaches. 
uh, we also discuss the threats and opportunities open to Amer facing America today. Um, we found and we talked about many of those challenges in a direct way. We talked about the revisionist powers, regional dictators, transnational threats such as jihadist terrorists and other transnational criminal organizations. These rivals are actively competing against the United States, against our allies, and against our partners. We've ignored these competitions for too long, particularly in the political and economic arenas. And strategic financial investments are one important tool in these economic competitions, and I think you'll be talking about that today in, in various ways. Ultimately, as the strategy makes clear, these are fundamentally contests for political power and political influence. They're contests between open societies and closed societies. And that's one common theme throughout the document. And it's a common theme that actually uh, captures the nature of our competitors. They all happen to be closed societies, more repressive societies or systems. The national security strategy made clear that there's no arc of history that ensures America's free economic and political system will automatically prevail. It calls upon us to act and to compete more effectively, guided by the principles from our founding documents. While recognizing these challenges and threats, the NSS also restores confidence that America is, has been, and will continue to be a force for good in the world, and that we have many opportunities to help set the conditions for peace and prosperity and for developing successful societies. We use the term successful societies as a phrase. I happen to like it personally. I like it too, actually. I think we know what makes a successful society, um, and it might be an interesting exercise for some of you to think about that yourselves, to work on it, some of the students in the audience. You know, what constitutes a successful society? Um, the administration <coughs> remains committed to using development assistance as a tool to achieve our national interests and to give America an advantage in these critical competitions. Administrator Mark Green, who many of you know in this audience and has been very helpful in framing this new approach for the administration. Um, one of the first points he made when he came on board, hello, was to explain the purpose of U.S. foreign assistance should be to end the need for it. Now imagine that. He wrote that in some of the documents that AIB published when he came on board. That means to make it so effective that target states can prosper on their own. America's historical record of providing support to aspiring partners is exceptional, and it's a record on which we will continue to build. We want to ensure that this assistance is effective and achieving the short and long-term goals with U.S. interests and values in mind. We remain committed to partnering with local reformers who are committed to tackling their economic and political challenges, and a theme throughout the document is the idea of cooperation with reciprocity. And by reciprocity, we mean coming to the table with something, with a commitment to reduce corruption, to improve transparency, to work on all of the things that many of you in this audience are working on as well. For years, as Dan mentioned and, 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 Mr. and Dr. Hamry, development experts have agreed that ODA alone cannot fulfill the massive needs around the world. And indeed, that's why you're here, and that's why this is being sponsored by Chevron as well. Uh, the private sector is needed. Um, at the conference, which I did not attend in 2015, countries agreed that sustainable development requires working together with the private sector, from micro enterprises to cooperatives to multinational corporations. Um, the NSS discusses this as well and talks about the administration's approach to development finance tools specifically. They're a way to catalyze this vast private sector, as well as multilateral development blanks and other institutions. The United States should not be left behind as other institutions use these types of investments and project finance to extend their influence, other countries, other competitors. A revitalized approach to DFI will allow us to promote stability, prosperity, and political reforms that we associate with democracies, such as good governance, rule of law, and free markets. To build stronger relationships with aspiring partners by supporting alternatives to state-directed investments that often leave developing countries worse off. And to assist aspiring partners to realize their potential more quickly, to transition to prosperous sovereign states accountable to their people. And this also happens to be good for American businesses as well, because these are markets that are opening up for American businesses. 
Um, as you know, our competitors are doing this pretty well, China especially throughout the Indo-Pacific. Uh, as you know, Russia uh, is doing this pretty well too throughout Europe, especially in the area of energy. So improving our approach to development finance will help the U.S. standing in the world, will help promote American interests and values, and the values of our allies and our partners. Um, in the NSS, as, as Dan mentioned, we mentioned DFI several times. The President also committed the United States to this concept in his APEC um, forum speech in November 2017, which I urge you to look at. Um, in addition, it's an important initiative in the President's 2019 budget. So the new DFI now being considered, uh, as most of you know better than I, is being organized around three core principles. First, to mobilize more private sector funding to increase the impact of U.S. development finance. Second, to modernize development finance tools so we can better cooperate with partners. And third, to reform how we do development finance to improve U.S. government effectiveness, accountability, and to consolidate the many diverse and disparate programs out there, many of which often are not well coordinated. The Bipartisan BUILD Act will catalyze this market-based private sector development approach. Um, it's, it's a bipartisan initiative, which is really important in today's political environment, and it shows that overall there's an understanding for how important this initiative really is. Um, while the administration believes there are a few critical improvements that might be needed in the bill, um, we support the goals of the bill very strongly and look forward to working with Congress to refine the bill as it moves forward. And I'll stop there, uh, and I, I know my colleagues yeah. wanted to speak too. Thank you. Just, Nadia, thank you very much for that. So let me just, just one question, which is about what prompted you to, certainly the, you've talked about the challenges and opportunities, but I, I would just be curious just a little bit further about the, the DFI. There's, the, there was also a recent statement out of the White House, I think, or last week in support of the BUILD Act, which I know Senator Coons is one of the co-sponsors of. Could you just, just a little bit more about, is it just, is it in essence the thinking is, is it because of China? Is it because of business opportunities for American business? For is it opportunities for American business? Is it about meeting development objectives, or is it all of the above? Um, you made my answer very easy. All of the above, Dan. Good. All of the above. Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially, this was a tool that will allow us to compete more effectively while also promoting prosperity uh, and progress in, in the target countries as well, and good for American businesses. Yeah, I've, I think I've read several of the national security strategies in the last 20 years. I don't think I've ever seen the term development finance or a development finance institution in them, so I think it's, it's an important, there were several important innovations in this national security strategy, and I think that was one of them. I suspect that will continue in the next national security strategies in the future. That will, I think, be a permanent part of the conversation going forward, so I think I think it's great. Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, there's bipartisan support for it, and there's a great team there leading these initiatives. That There's an in intellectual kind of confluence there with Ray Washburn at OPIC, Mark Green at AID, um, Everett Eisenstadt on the NSC. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're really good, smart people working on modernizing uh, our economic toolkit, which was another term we used in the strategy. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nadia. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Ms. Sims-Wilson, thanks for being here. You're the chair-elect of the National Association of Securities Professionals. Yes. You're also a, an investment manager in Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, and why, you know why I've asked you to be on this panel. Tell us why I've asked yes. you to be on this panel. <laughs> Good morning Good and morning. thank you. And, and for the record, my letter said be here at 9.45. Right. So, so, so uh, <laughs> I was just kidding. <laughs> But I believe I was asked to be here today because uh, the National Association of Securities Professionals is a 35-year-old trade organization that has as its members many public pension plans around the country. Uh, from the largest, the California Public Employees Retirement System, $300 billion in assets. The New York State Common Retirement Fund, $180 billion in assets. Uh, the New York City retirement systems, $190 billion in assets. Texas Teachers retirement system, $140 billion in assets. So the largest pool of private sector capital in the United States is found within public pension plans. And uh, this, this uh, plenary is about billions to trillions, where the trillions of dollars are in public pension plans. And what we at NASP have done is through a partnership with USAID, called MEDA, mobilizing institutional investors to develop Africa's infrastructure, we have formed a council of 45, 
of these pension funds, foundations, endowments, and insurance companies. And we are introducing them, educating them, exposing them to opportunities to invest in infrastructure on the continent of Africa. As you know, there's not enough development money in the world to adequately uh, develop infrastructure on the African continent, so the private sector must be engaged. And so in the United States, uh, the, we are in the lowest yielding interest rate environment in a generation. Even though rates have started to move up slowly, it's still the lowest in a generation. And our public pension funds are aggressively seeking yield. They're looking for safe, risk-adjusted returns, and we are informing them and educating them that those returns are to be found on the continent of Africa. So we've had two trips recently, one last year in May where we took uh, our pension funds to South Africa and then again in March of this year where we went to Dakar, Senegal and back to South Africa. Now, these public pension funds, teachers, civil servants, um, transportation workers, uh, police and fire, they now are occupying the chair of the investment committee and other trustee positions on the board of their pension funds and they allocate assets all over the world. They vote as to where these assets go. And um, currently less than 1% of assets go to the continent of Africa. And so I'm... If you could go to 2%, it would be unbelievable. I mean, 2% of several trillion, yeah. That's a big number. That's a big number. That's a big number. And what we're focused on is, is tearing down this perception of risk. The average American watching television never sees, for example, the beautiful skylines of Johannesburg or Nairobi or the miles and miles of middle-class suburbs in Dakar. They only learn about corruption and famine and Ebola and... Um, what else? I mean, just everything negative. And so we take many of these uh, large, sophisticated pension funds had never set foot on the continent of Africa. So when they got off the plane in Johannesburg and they said, wow, this looks like New York City, and Santon and Rosebank <coughs> looks like Westchester. And when they went to Dakar, they were amazed at, because they just had no perception. And so not only are we taking them there, but we're introducing them to African-focused and African-based infrastructure funds that are investing in power and water and transportation. And I'm happy to report that with only 18 months of effort, we've already had some successes. Uh, the city and county of San Francisco has invested $100 million in a power fund focused on investing in African power projects. Um, Prudential Insurance Company has invested $180 million to date. And we even have African uh, public pension plans that are working with U.S. institutional investors as well. So it's a two-way street. And our project, we were just notified, is, is uh, going to be featured at the G20 in Buenos Aires in November as a demonstration project of how the private sector uh, can work uh, profitably in infrastructure. Donna, just tell a couple of, there, you, you said that just even just with this, this short process, there's been a series of investments already made yes. because of this. Yes, I, I, I just, yeah, I just, it's just mentioned amazing. it. just amazing. And it's because there are tremendous opportunities to be found. Moody's, uh, the, the credit agency, has done a study that said that of infrastructure projects, less default in Africa than anywhere in the world, including the United States. And that study is on our website. And there's going to be more to come, right? You've got more, more projects to come. To come. You can't yes. share about it now, but right. w watch we, this we, space. Exactly. We have at least three more uh, public pension funds on our, uh, on our panel, on our, um, uh, our council, that are very close to making investments in other fund managers. That you, if you let met. us know, we'll tweet it out. Yes, afterwards, we absolutely okay? will. We're, thanks, we're more than thanks happy for being to do here. that. Thank you. Thank you. Zamira, thanks for being here. Thank you. So Zamira is, I'm so glad you're here. Zamira, you start, you're from Kazakhstan, but you're a citizen of the world. And you are based in London. And you uh, started your career at USAID. And then you have had a 24-year fabulous career at Chevron. Thanks for being here. Tell us a little bit about your personal journey, because I think it reflects the journey of Kazakhstan, but also reflects the journey of Chevron. Yes. 
So thanks for being here. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm really happy to participate in today's event because I think it, it presents a really great opportunity for the dialogue between private sector, you know, development agencies, NGOs, and they think that when we talk about the challenges that the world faces today, I think there is a lot of work that can be split between all of us. And I think that the dialogue that we're having today is really very enriching. Uh, answering your question is, um, uh, back in, uh, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed the end of 91, and that's when my country of Kazakhstan gained independence. And USAID was one of the first uh, technical assistant agencies that came to our country, and I happened to be one of the first uh, three foreign service nationals working for the AID regional mission for Central Asia, and it was based in Almaty at that time. And I'm actually very, very thrilled to have my former boss, Paul Affini, to be in this room. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I learned so much from you personally. I learned so much in my two years in AID. But the important thing about the, the development agencies is they do play a critical role, especially in the, in the most difficult and challenging stages of the country's development. And, you know, we had a lot of different projects in different areas like health and education and economic development, energy, environment, democratic initiatives that were really, you know, implemented in, in the region and including in my country. But I think the important thing is that really to, to, to tailor and adjust the programs. And, and I'm really happy to, today to share with you that Kazakhstan, that was a recipient of a lot of technical aid from USAID, now in a position to provide such support regionally. And today, <coughs> Kazakhstan ranks the third after the United States and European Union in providing you know, uh, regional support. And uh, one of the examples is, um, is uh, uh, educational uh, assistance to Afghan students in you know, gaining uh, their bachelor's and master's degrees in Kazakh universities. And uh, uh, shortly after Chevron came into Kazakhstan, I joined Chevron uh, you know, in the government and public affairs department. And then what has really you know, inspired me in my career in Chevron is that a lot of the stuff that we do in our business, being a private company, we do care about the development of the societies where we work. And I know that I don't want this to sound as a cliche, but we talk a lot about that, you know, you can either give a person a fish or you can give the fishing rod and then teach the, the fishing so that the person can support the livelihood and support the families. And they think that's exactly what we do in Chevron in terms of in addition to our direct foreign investments and in billions of dollars that in many, many cases, really worked as a catalyst to bringing you know, more prosperity to the countries where we do business. But also, in addition, is uh, some of the social investments that we do. And in every project that we do around the world, we always look for the element of sustainability. And it really doesn't matter whether this project is tens of thousands of dollars or millions of thousands of dollars. Is It's important that uh, you know, the, the investments that we make in the societies they are sustainable and uh, they act as a catalyst for the development of the society. And then, but in order to do that, I always say that it's, it's easy to write a check if you have the money. It's much more challenging, but yet much more rewarding and inspiring when you can grow together with your partners. And this is something we really you know, witness in many, many countries of the world, whether it's in Angola, you, you know, the Angola Partnership Initiative was mentioned today here, and my colleague Heather Kalp is here. You know, she leads our Niger Delta Partnership Initiative. We have uh, great programs in Thailand, in Bangladesh, in Kazakhstan. And the, like I said, the most rewarding and inspiring is really to see our partners grow together with us. And some of the best examples that we have is that when we were able to support some of the specific projects with uh, NGOs or think tanks, and then you turn around and a few years later, you see that these organizations are now able to support others. And then they're sharing their expertise. And, and then in terms of our social investments, I see that this is the most rewarding part. And it's really about true partnership. It's about growing and succeeding together with your partners. And these partners can be the government stakeholders. It can be local governments, central governments. It can be NGOs. It can be local communities. You name it. Samira, just, just two things. Talk, talk about in Kazakhstan, which is one of the great development stories of, of the last 30 years. It went from $1,000 per capita to $14,000 per capita. This is not a story that's told very well. 
just could you just tell us how much has Chevron put into the country of Kazakhstan yeah. between investment, social investment, <coughs> paying taxes, partnering with local supply uh, chain partners? Chevron, Chevron is one of the first uh, large foreign investors that came to Kazakhstan right after the independence. And in, in fact, two, years, uh, two weeks ago, I was really fortunate to participate in some of the celebration events marking the, the 25th anniversary of creating of the joint venture, Tengi Chevron, that developed the supergiant uh, oil field in Western Kazakhstan. And then I can tell you, you know, some of the numbers that were actually quoted by the president of the country was that TCO in the 25 years of its activities TCO in the country is, the, is, the is a joint, Tengi Chevron, yeah. it's a joint venture where we are one of the leading shareholders, yeah. contributed $125 million. No, billion. 20, $125 billion billion in, in direct uh, you know, contributions to the economy. Just Kazakhstan. the country of Kazakhstan, $125 yeah. billion dollars with a B. And, and these, are, these are the jobs, these are the taxes, these are the tariff payments, this is the social investments. Yeah. And, and when we talk about the private investments, I think it's always important to remember about the multiplier effect of these investment dollars. Because uh, you know, this goes into training, this goes yeah. into really uh, developing the human capital of the countries that we work. And then it goes, the important part will be the, the supply chain. So, Zamir, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness. Uh, and I'm going to ask for my audience's understanding and my friends on the panel's understanding. I, I was explaining earlier, we were calling an audible. We, Senator Coons is here, and I want to take advantage of his presence because I know he's got a very busy day. If you read the newspaper, you know he's got a very busy day. Um, and I'm going to ask you all, what I'd ask you to do, my f panelist friends, if you would just briefly sit down, because I know we want to hear from Senator Coons, and, if, and I'll beg your forgiveness, and we'll return to the panel in a few minutes, okay? So thank you, my thank friends. You. Thank you. Thank you. Is John Hammer here? Where's Hammer? Me? Okay. Okay. So Senator Coons is one of my favorite senators. I'm a Republican, and so I'm like, this is like, I'm, I'm in like the Senator Coons fan club. Thank you very much for being here. And Senator Coons, I, um, you're a senator from Delaware. You're an, you're an Africanist before Africa was cool. Uh, and you have a fabulous staff. You have a fabulous staff. And you have this great partnership between you and your staff. And you've been the leader on the BUILD Act, which is, and uh, we wanted to hear from you. Please come on up, Senator. And please join me in welcoming Senator Coons. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, um, Dan, for the opportunity, uh, and thank you to the panel for understanding. Uh, I commute almost daily uh, from Delaware, where I have three spectacular teenagers uh, whom I occasionally try to parent. And uh, one of the joys and challenges of our infrastructure needs, not just in the developing world, but here at home, uh, is that occasionally it runs into a little snag. Uh, so the train before us broke down, uh, and the train I was on very graciously stopped for a very long time in order to allow the entire other train to board our train. And you know, it's all about going farther by traveling together. <laughs> so let me move quickly, if I might, to the subject so that you can get back to the substance uh, of the panel. On February 27th, I introduced uh, the better utilization of investments leading to development. Isn't that clever? It spells BUILD, the BUILD Act of 2018, uh, with my friend and colleague, Republican Chairman, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Bob Corker. Uh, and one of the things I think is important about this particular piece of legislative effort is how broadly bipartisan it is. Uh, Bob and I introduced it in the Senate. Our lead co-sponsors in the House are Congressman Ted Yoho and Congressman Adam Smith. Um, and we've since built it out to eight bipartisan co-sponsors on the Foreign Relations Committee, and I believe as of now 16 broadly bipartisan co-sponsors in the House side. This is the only way real legislating happens. Um, so let me just quickly give you a review of why I introduced it, what I think it's going to accomplish, and why I'm actually hopefully even optimistic that it will become law by the end of the year. Um, it modernizes the way in which the U.S. government um, develops Finance does development finance and solves three sort of core problems, the scope, the tools, and meeting competition. Uh, so first, let me talk about scope. It provides the U.S. government with a 21st century development finance institution with the ability to mobilize private capital at greater scale and with greater complexity than the fairly limited and constrained capacity we have today. I'll remind you that in 2015, Countries of the world adopted the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 specific and admirable goals to 
end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all as part of a new sustainable international development agenda. And I believe the United States should and can play a leadership role in marshalling the world's efforts towards achieving these goals by 2030. But there's no way that traditional aid, by which I mean decades old large public sector grants um, delivered government to government, will be sufficient or the most effective, or the most efficient way uh, to harness the resources necessary to bring the world's poorest out of poverty, particularly in a continent with which I've been most engaged and to which I've paid the most attention, the continent of Africa. Official development assistance, as you know, is now dwarfed by private capital flows. Um, just within the United States, uh, external financial flows to sub-Saharan Africa increased from 20 billion in 1990 to over 120 billion by 2012. Um, and that's primarily increased private capital flows, while U.S. Uh, direct government-to-government -government grants uh, have not grown at anything like a six-fold increase. And that same pattern would be repeated in many of the other development partners around the world. So it stands to reason the U.S. and other donor countries committed um, to development, to alleviating poverty, should find the most effective ways to mobilize this rapidly growing private capital uh, deployment for the purpose of development. OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, is a small but effective agency, now decades old, that helps promote investments in emerging markets. I first became familiar with it because I wrote my senior thesis as an undergraduate in college on U.S. foreign aid policy back in 1985, and strikingly, OPIC has not been significantly revisited, reviewed, or revised since well before 1985, so this really has been an extended field practicum from my college work. Um, but the first four years that I served in the Senate when I chaired the subcommittee on Africa uh, and made many trips to the continent and held a number of hearings on our multilateral uh, and bilateral development um, capabilities and agencies, I realized this is um, a, a plucky, small, capable, but underpowered uh, development uh, agency. It has not been reauthorized by the Congress since 2003. So every year an agency fundamentally designed to make long-term investments in the developing world finds itself forced to rely on annual appropriations, or now sadly speaking as an appropriator, sadly 60-day, 30-day, or even three-day continuing resolutions. Imagine trying to plan based on that. So it goes without saying, but the congressional failure to reauthorize OPIC beyond these short-term fits and starts is not a recipe for success or for boldness. The Build Act creates and authorizes a new U.S. International Development Finance Corporation and authorizes it for 20 years and raises its maximum contingent liability to $60 billion from its current portfolio limit of $29 billion, which hasn't changed in 20 years. Doubling the portfolio of the United States available for development finance is significant, especially when you consider in the current environment the repeated significant downward pressure on traditional foreign assistance funding through USAID and the State Department. So the bill expands the relative scale of private capital versus government grants that should be available in coming years. It also allows us to employ a wider, more updated suite of development tools to partner with the private sector and with private capital. Sophistication greater than OPIC's current instruments and sophistication uh, capable of meeting what our competitors are currently using and deploying. OPIC's constrained by statute because it cannot invest in equity. It doesn't allow non-U.S. persons or entities to invest in its products. OPEC cannot make loans or guarantees in local currency. And the project you direct here, Dan, at CSIS, the Project on Prosperity and Development, uh, released a report in 2016 that showed how OPEC compares to 15 European development finance institutions. There's one striking difference between our OPIC and almost all the European DFIs, the authority to participate in equity investments. Our bill would directly address that problem and thank you for your leading work on this area. Investing as a limited equity partner, why does that matter? It's important for two reasons. First, our European partners, including the UK CDC or Commonwealth Development Corporation and so many others can invest in equity and now we'd be able to coordinate them with them for greater scale and greater impact. Second, equity investments have the potential to attract greater capital because investors see governments have a seat at the decision-making table where they can help drive development outcomes in a way a simple loan guarantor can't, and it may lead to more positive returns and outcomes that we all hope to see. Uh, the president and CEO of OPIC currently, Ray Washburn, did a terrific job last week uh, in a hearing in the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, explaining OPIC's limitations 
and why this particular equity authority would allow our new development finance institution to collaborate uh, with our partners and allies on larger projects and investments. When you consider the United States has the world's most sophisticated a capital investing business community and a world leading understanding of finance, it doesn't make sense for us to be falling behind our allies on the use of the most modern development finance tools. With a larger portfolio, OPIC can take more responsible risks and expand its investments in countries where it can achieve broad-based economic growth and study reliable returns on investment. Because this new development finance institution will be closely linked to USAID, let me emphasize that, closely linked to USAID, foreign service officers serving in developing countries will have access to a broader range of development finance tools to help address constraints to economic growth. This bill would give the US the ability as well, finally, to compete for influence, for significance in Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Latin America, a number of other countries, but most principally China, are deploying significant capital at levels previously unseen in the developing world. Through its One Belt, One Road framework, China is investing in energy and infrastructure and telecommunications and extractive industries throughout the world. I just finished leading a bipartisan delegation of five senators to four countries um, spanning the African continent, and Chinese influence is palpable and omnipresent. From closer ties to African and between African and Chinese leaders to the very visible presence of Chinese goods, services, and workers. Now, China is now Africa's largest economic partner. It surpassed the United States nearly a decade ago, and according to a report released by McKinsey, FDI from China and Africa grew at an annual rate of 40% per year over the past decade. Between 2000 and 2014, Chinese banks, contractors, and the government loaned more than $86 billion directly to Africa, according to research from SAIS. Uh, Mr. Washburn, the head of OPIC, pointed out last week that China is expanding its influence not just in Africa, uh, but throughout Latin America, for example, investing billions to renovate Port-au-Prince. I similarly saw that influence uh, on a trip with Senator McCain to Southeast Asia last summer. Um, we have different priorities and values than the Chinese in the developing world, and we don't follow closely the Chinese model, but we need to show up. We need to show up and participate with comparable proposals for countries where their governments are seeking to provide significant development opportunities to rapidly growing populations and where fragile institutions are under threat, I think, from competing models of governance. So in addition to the bipartisan support for the Build Act in Congress that I mentioned at the outset, I'm genuinely excited and encouraged to hear strong support from the Trump administration for this proposal. The President's national security strategy says, and I quote, the United States will modernize its development finance tools so that U.S. companies have incentives to capitalize on real opportunities in developing countries. With these changes, the United States will not be left behind as other states use investments in project finance to extend their influence. That's the national security strategy. President Trump himself, speaking in Vietnam in last November, said, quote, we are committed to reforming our development finance institutions so they better incentivize private sector investment. And the President's 2019 budget request proposed a reformed and consolidated United States development finance institution. And just last week, the administration issued a statement expressing strong support for this bipartisan, bicameral bill. Now, I am grateful to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for their very real investment and engagement. I'm particularly grateful to Tom Mancinelli, my staff, who's worked very well with you and with many others uh, who've helped pull this together, um, and with the folks both on the committee uh, and on Senator Corker's staff. Um, it would not be possible uh, without so many folks pulling together across so many offices and teams. But to believe that this is really possible, um, that this decades-old significant but constrained development finance institution can be now um, redesigned, reauthorized, and reborn with a strong partnership with USAID, with a clear focus on development assistance, um, excites me and encourages me. On the walls of my office, I have seven pens from President Obama, where he has signed into law various bipartisan bills that I had some small role in advancing. I do not yet have a pen from President Trump. And I am excited about the very real prospect of being for the first time with our president at a bill signing ceremony, at a bill that advances America's genuine national interests. So thank you for the opportunity. I am happy to take a few questions if I can impose upon the panel for just a few more minutes. And then I will rock it back to our work on the Judiciary Committee trying to defend the rule of law.
know, Senator, I've t you know, I had a series of questions for you, but I think I felt like your remarks covered a lot of it. I'm just, I'm just so taken uh, with your leadership on this and your team's leadership on this. I'm wondering if we might just have a couple of questions from the audience sure, for you. Please. Is that okay? Yep. So let's get a couple of, okay. All right, so who's got a microphone? Aaron, Sundar, okay. This woman here and this gentleman here, we're gonna do these two, these, the, uh, these two folks here are gonna speak. Uh, brief, name, rank, serial number, short, right? Okay, I think we know each Hi, other. Hi, Senator, good to see you again. Good Rachel Oswald, you. congressional Glad quarterly. to see you off the hill for one. <laughs> I have to ask it, but then I'll have a, a related question. Have you decided how you're gonna vote on uh, Director Pompeo? Oh boy. Um, as you well know, uh, I voted against Director Pompeo when uh, he was nominated for CIA director. <laughs> Uh, I've had a number of conversations with him. I've heard from a number of people who've served with him. Uh, and I had a number of questions uh, during the course of the confirmation hearing. Uh, I am leaning against voting for him, but I have not made a final decision. Um, and I'm working with my staff on a, sort of a final announcement. OK, let's, why don't we, let's, let's go to the next question. Is it working? Is it fully operational? Okay, here's another one. Uh, my name is Frederick Ruiz Ramon. Um, I run a small company that actually does what I would call profitable development in developing countries. And so my question goes not to the large investors and the large US companies that might be looking at investing, which OPEC has tend to work more with them, but rather small companies that look to get their products and to do investments in other parts of the world. Does your bill have anything having to do with risk mitigation in any kind of way for U.S. companies that are interested in investing overseas? Okay. It, Let's it, see if we get it. So this is risk mitigation for countries. So other risk instruments. That, that's the risk mitigation for private sector investors. Okay. Now I think OPIC does a lot of that, and the Development Credit Authority does a lot of that too. So I'm I'm sure the the new Development Finance Corporation will do those sorts of things, and I know yes. that, right, Senator? Short answer, yes. Yep, okay. Okay, let's get some others. Let's think hard about the questions we're gonna ask here, right? Let's not have gotcha questions, please. Okay, so this, this person here, uh, my friend from Team Water, these two folks here, okay? Keep it short. Good morning, um, I'm the former U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria. I wanted to ask about XM because Exim is a big missing part of the financing. And I don't know whether in your new bill you address Exim or not, but that's a big challenge and that would really be helpful if we included Exim or he had an additional bill that addressed Exim and Great. expanding what it could do. Great, thank you, thank you. And let's get my friend from Team Water. Uh, good morning, Senator Coons. Thanks for being here with us. Just, I want to give you a chance to further delineate the relationship between the new Development Finance Corporation and USAID that you uh, underlined in your uh, your remarks there. I'm particularly concerned about, uh, as as Tom knows, the Development Credit Authority and the pro poor focus of those uh, uh, credit risk guarantees. Okay. Uh, on both of those questions, first, the Development Credit Authority. One of the things. This is my view, but one of the things that's happened over the years. Um, is that AID has gotten more actively involved uh, in credit and credit extension and development finance um, because OPIC has been constrained. It's been more cautious, perhaps, um, than it might otherwise be. Um, my, ho my hope, my goal was to end up with these functions under one roof, one team, but with very explicit connections to AID, both at the leadership level and at the operational level, um, so that the very capable development professionals of AID who are in many places best suited, best deployed to identify opportunities and have used uh, the Development Credit Authority to that purpose um, would still be actively integrated with it. I recognize there's been some concerns raised about whether or not the Development Credit Authority remains in AID or gets pulled into a new development finance uh, institution. Um, the bill has it coming in. Um, my goal is to achieve some efficiency um, that helped attract some Republican co-sponsors um, but to not lose the integration with AID, the connection to the ground, and the flexibility uh, and deployment that Development Credit Authority has shown. So I, I think we're aware of the concerns, and some of this will get hammered out um, in markups in May in both committees. Okay. Um, as for Exim, I mean, this is a real tragedy of partisan Amen. politics. Amen. Uh, not, not really partisan politics, because there are both Democrats and Republicans uh, my first long meeting with President Trump uh, with a group of a dozen senators now a year ago, uh, XM was a big piece of what we were all there talking about. 
um, because we have, we have harmed ourselves as a country um, in preventing the full deployment of our export financing agency um, because of fights over the chairmanship of it. Uh, a gentleman was nominated to be chair who I became convinced after meeting with him, as did a whole group of colleagues, uh, was not committed to its success, to be gracious. Mm. Um, and there's been this sort of grinding uh, standoff over the board. Um, I, I view this less as a problem of needing Exim to be reauthorized or invigorated or given to authorities than it is to just straighten out our politics and accept that Exim is, a, is an important significant part of our being engaged in global trade. There are some folks in this town who have for a very long time agitated against Exim, thinking it interferes with the private capital markets and has the government doing things that private capital can and should do. I just disagree. <laughs> and there are competitors to some um, businesses that would really prefer that their competitors not have access to uh, Exim financing. And I think those two in combination have led to a really unfortunate impasse, I support XM and think it's a vital part of our being an export-oriented economy. Senator, I'm cognizant of your time. Let me ask you one last question, because sure. you were an Africanist before Africa was cool, Senator. <laughs> so, Senator, just- Africa has always been cool. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Thank you. Thank you. That's true. That's true. But cool in this town. How about this? Okay. But, but Senator, could you talk about, I'd like just to, do, just to reflect a little bit on Africa as an opportunity for the United States. Yep. I think we spend too much time in this town seeing Africa as a Absolutely. challenge or a problem to manage or, I mean, it's a, you know, there's a humongous opportunity and I know yep. you know that. Yep. Um, so I, uh, for seven years, hosted an annual conference in my home state whose title was Opportunity Africa. I love it. Uh, for exactly that reason. Uh, part of it is to be accountable to the people who hired me and who I work for to explain to them what am I doing leading these delegations across the continent. Um, and so part of it was to have business leaders in my home state from small startup companies like DuPont or AstraZeneca <laughs> yeah. um, standing up and saying this is one of our markets of greatest opportunity. Um, folks uh, may not believe it from me, but when the CEO of uh, Dow DuPont or DuPont or AstraZeneca or General Electric, which all have facilities in my state, stand up and say, this is the most promising um, continent of opportunity in this century, that helps. Second, we have a robust diaspora community in Delaware, as there is all over the country. We happen to have strong Liberian, Kenyan, and Nigerian communities in Delaware. Um, and one of the things that I didn't mention in my very quick review um, of this bill is the, the new, um, a new vehicle of diaspora bonds that are intentionally designed as a way uh, to mobilize um, the impact investing capability of so many very successful uh, diaspora communities in the United States, um, and many of them African diaspora communities. Um, next is that if you just look at the demographics, it is the only continent that is right side up for a workforce versus aging population in this century. Um, there are enormous uh, logistical, infrastructure, governance, natural resource challenges, but across 54 countries on an incredible continent, blessed with enormous human capital, tremendous cultures, and vast natural resources. Uh, when I was in the private sector, working for a global manufacturing company 20 years ago, we, like every other company at the time, we were trying to figure out where was the next China. China figured it out 20 years ago, it's Africa. They've beaten us to it. And as a yes. country, the United States is incredibly well regarded across the continent of Africa. President Bush's greatest legacy, I think, is PEPFAR, uh, which showed an uninterested humanitarian commitment to helping the continent tackle and tame a horrific pandemic. Burkina Faso, one of the countries we just visited, has made the single greatest progress on the continent in shifting HIV AIDS prevalence, and they take the majority of the cost burden themselves. This is the fourth poorest country on earth where American engagement over now 15 years has made just a life-saving difference. We, we are well-regarded, we are well-grounded, we have terrific diaspora communities. We are committed to democracy, human rights, and a free press like no other society. Why would we not seize this opportunity right before us? I'm thrilled the Secretary of Commerce is about to yeah, lead good. a big um, continent-wide um, delegation of many business leaders, and I'm really excited that this bill may well end up being a principal initiative of the Trump administration in this year with regards to the developing world. So, Senator, I know you gotta go. Could you all join me in thanking the thank Senator? Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much.
Okay, panelists, panelists. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, all right. All right, guys. Okay, okay, panelists, come on back. Hit play. All right. So where were we? All right. So, so I think, I mean, I think you can see why uh, we wanted to have Senator Coons come and speak, and it's certainly timely as all as as can be, given the Build Act given the national security strategy, the statements from the Trump administration, there is an alignment of interests. I think the most important thing that we can get done, uh, one of the most important legacies, soft power legacies of the Trump administration in partnership with the Cong a bipartisan partnership in the Congress is gonna be the BUILD Act, this is my view, and I think it's in line with this conversation we're having about from billions to trillions. So, so Zamira, thank you again for, for, uh, for putting up with me having to, to, to stop the conversation when we did. It was for a good, for a good <laughs> cause. Can I just need to, I wanted one last question to ask you, Zamira, and then I want to turn to my other two friends on the panel, which is, Zamira, so when, you, when Chevron makes an investment, when it makes a $10 billion, 30 or 40 year investment, let's obviously assume that you probably want to find some energy in the ground. There's probably a, there's a thing called energy. Yeah, that's probably important. But what are the other things that you look for? Because when we talk about from billions to trillions, it, there's other things that, that go into that. What are the things you look for? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, as you noted, being in the energy industry, first of all, we look for resources. That will be the first one. But is that, so is, we're having a microphone issue, Zamira. Do, you need, do I need to lend her mine? Better? So being, being an energy business... Use, use this one, Zamir. Okay. Sorry. No, it's like a talk like show. A singer. Yeah, so I was exactly. being accused of being the Phil Donahue of, of think tanks. <laughs> now I feel like well, this is like the Phil Donahue show. So it's go okay. ahead. Okay. So being an energy business, obviously the first uh, thing we look for is uh, resources. But um, not less important is a stable uh, investment climate that really is built up from different ingredients, such as a good fiscal regime, um, rule of law, sanctity of contracts, good business practices. But other things that we look for, obviously, is uh, in terms of local talent and uh, local supply chain. And, um, but when we talk about local talent and local supply chain, I think it's important to, to appreciate you cannot just come to a country and assume that everything will be ready for you. Uh, because I think that we as private sector need to do our part to help grow, uh, to help these countries to be more competitive in the, uh, globally. And one of the examples when I was talking about the supply chain, obviously in the last five years at Chevron we invested uh, about $167 billion in global goods and services. And that's a, that's a big number, but in some countries, okay. 167 billion in, lo uh, in globally in local goods and services. And then, as you can imagine, uh, local content in goods and services is a very high priority across the globe, whether it's in UK, in Kazakhstan, United in States. Nigeria, in the United States, it's, it's a big priority now. And, uh, but the important role that our company can play is that really help grow the supply chain. Because it's very easy to say that, oh, there are no competitive local companies who are going to, to hire a, a foreign company. But the, the most sustainable approach to it will be to really facilitate the creation of joint ventures or consortium between Western companies and local companies so that it can really grow the capability and capacity of the local businesses so that they can be you know, sustainable participants. Of the, of the whole you know, economic development. And another piece to the puzzle will be the development of local and national employees. And I'm very proud to say that out of the 50,000 employees that we have globally and 170,000 you know, contractors, about 95% um, of this workforce work locally from local countries. And in countries like where we were for many, many years, like Angola and Nigeria, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Thailand, we have about 95% uh, of the workforce are local employees. And so these are the people who have stable jobs, they have stable income, uh, they have organizational ca capability, and they have skills 
to compete not only in our industry, but outside of our industry. And that's wh where I see the big role that private sector can play. Z Zamir, just, you, so you're at a big global multinational, but you also had a prior life at AID. So what's the role of, what, from where you sit now, what, what, why, is, why are institutions like AID or the Danish aid agency or the Italian agency, why are they important? Now, what's, what, what, do they, what do they, what can they contribute? Because I said earlier, we don't just need, we certainly need a lot more foreign direct investment, we need a lot of local savings, we need sovereign wealth funds, but we're still gonna need foreign assistance. So what is that good for? Because you've been in that conversation. You know, uh, based on my experience, and I mentioned it in my opening remarks, I do believe strongly that there is a big place and a big role for the um, development agencies to play you know, across the globe. And then where I saw from my own experience is a lot of the technical expertise in different aspects that uh, the, the AID contractors and the companies bring. But I think that the next step that we should take is really to have a true partnership between the development agencies and private sector. Okay. To your point of taking it from billions to trillions, and I think the globe is facing so many issues and so many challenges that there is a, a, a lot of work for all of us. And I think we can only really tackle this if we work in partnership, like we've done in many countries of the world, and I think it's a very good experience. It's a good success. Thank Great. you. Okay, so I just have to say one other, as an editorial, so, so Zamir, you were a Foreign Service National, you were Foreign Service National of the Year in 1994. You promised not to I know, say but I'm that. sorry, I had to say it, because there's a lot of AID people in here. And we're doing an event, I think on June 1, on the critical role of Foreign Service Nationals in development. So maybe, maybe I'm gonna con convince you to come back for that. I'm gonna <laughs> come back to you about this, because we're trying thank to get you. to it. So I may come back to you. Thanks a lot, Zamir, thank you and very thank much. Thank you for embarrassing thank, me about that. You're welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> I know I'm gonna pay for that later, but. But, so Laura, thanks for being here. Laura Fragenti, you're, you're a friend and a colleague. You're now at the KPMG Think Tank. You have had a fabulous career in international development. You, ran, you just ret uh, left running the Italian aid agency, AICS. A the Itali Italian government is one of the most, the, the people of Italy are some of the most generous in the world in development. And then you had a 25 year career before that at the World Bank. Thanks for being here. I'm so pleased you're able to join us. So when if I say to you billions to trillions, what, what does that mean? What does that mean from the different hats that you've worn? Well, I think that we all started thinking about, uh, you know, how to get from billions to trillions after Addis Ababa, and I think that um, one of the things that to me occurred uh, almost immediately is that the real issue was really not how to raise more money. I think that some distinguished speakers uh, before me explained that the reality is that there is a lot of money ready to be invested. The point uh, is the alignment uh, of these resources with the objectives that we want to achieve. And the other thing is to make sure that there is a kind of a more, I would <coughs> say, even distribution of these resources. Because in reality, if you look at the uh, you know, resources available in the aggregate, they are obviously there and sufficient to meet a lot of the development needs. But if we start disaggregating in terms of needs country by country, yeah. we would see that investors have very strong preferences. So um, uh, at the time, for example, that I was you know, working on Latin America, the vast majority of people would like to invest in Brazil, much less so uh, in Central America for several reasons. So you have asked me to start thinking a little bit about these questions from the point of view of what is the role of public sector. And I have, basically I see two very important roles that the public sector can play. The first one is, uh, some of you uh, use the word the risking, which is in fact uh, you know, what needs to be done for the investment, but what does de-risking mean in real terms? I mean, it really means, I feel, to bring those countries that are not as attractive, those countries that would be marginalized from the flow of investment at a level of conditions that will make them more attractive. And that is basically, uh, you know, investing in two sets of things. The first one is human capital. Uh, I remember that I was struck in, 
the 90s, when I started working on Angola immediately after uh, you know, the peace process took, that you had the big oil companies that were all going to Angola and in the airplane landing in Rwanda, they were bringing everybody, not the highly sophisticated uh, you know, engineers, they were bringing the bookkeepers, they were bringing the accountants, they were bringing everybody because the country didn't have anything. And so if you really don't have that core uh, quality of people that can actually participate in this investment, make their own, and then return the investment and redistribute in the society, the type of growth that you are able to generate is not the growth that actually creates stable economies and stable society. The second part, obviously, that is very important is all the transparency governance agenda. The reality is that when we are saying there is need for de-risking is because some of these environments are risky, and that's a fact. And so, uh, you know, it's very, very important that the public sector works with this government to make sure that conditions from that point of view improve. The second part that I think uh, it's also often uh, not really, that, that there is not sufficient focus, is the fact that the private sector is very ready to invest, but the private sector wants to have projects that are well designed, designed carefully designed, and that are bankable. And I think that not all the investment opportunities that are out there are ready to actually be the object of an investment. And I think that on this, there is a very big role for the public sector in general, for the bilaterals, for the multilateral organizations to actually put their uh, effort to make sure that these projects are designed, appraised, and assessed in such a way that there is their seal of approval that is actually in itself a strongly de-risking factor for a private investor. That, you know, there has been some, uh, you know, review of, uh, you know, the technical feasibility, the economic feasibilities of these infrastructures, for example, for them to actually come in and invest. And so I, I really feel that you know, this is what we should be focusing also, and not so much on the fact on how to raise more money, yeah. but how to actually make sure that that money gets aligned to the objectives that we are trying to achieve. Yeah, Laura, I've often heard the, the conversation about that there's plenty of money for infrastructure. It's a question of what unquote bankable deals. And that bankable deals can mean lots of different things, but I think it's along the lines of what you're saying. It's about rule of law and clear rules of the game, the governance agenda. And so those are the sorts of things that aid agencies have a very important role to play in that because companies themselves cannot, cannot do that. No company on their own can do that. Yeah. But it's, that's something that the World Bank Group can do. That's something the Italian aid agency can do. That's also something or the Danish aid agency can do. So that, that requires a certain kind of certain kind of an approach oftentimes done through official development assistance, right? That's, that's, so I, I share your view on that. Thank you. Okay, so Minister uh, Tornes, thanks for being here. Ole Tornes, right? Minister Ole yes. Tornes, thanks for being here. Um, I, as I said earlier, I appreciate your flexibility. As I said earlier, this, is, this was, pol you know, there's a, a busy political day here in Washington. I know as a minister, you're also a member of parliament, so you've been in politics, so you're, you're sympathetic and you understood. I'm very Absolutely. grateful for your flexibility. Absolutely. We, you're the um, Minister for Development for the, for the Kingdom of Denmark. We're very grateful here at CSIS for our partnership with the Foreign Ministry and, and with, the, with, your, with, your, uh, with Danita. Um, thank you for being here. And so uh, I know you, you think about the issue from billions of trillions from a number of different perspectives in Denmark. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity just to say a few words on how we are actually addressing the issue of from billions to trillions, because as was said in, in the very good speech by the senator, uh, we need to think differently. No, there is no room for business as usual. We need to look into how we can uh, scale up and accelerate uh, our, our finances for uh, development, because we cannot close the gap if we want to fulfill the or achieve the SDGs with only official development aid. We need to find other resources, other ways of, of financing uh, all the investments. And we have worked with this very specifically after Addis Ababa. And uh, we use our DFI, IFU as it's called, um, which celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. We use this as catalyst um, the DFI has loan guarantees from um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, from our aid, 
And uh, by using the uh, DFI, we have set up specific investment funds uh, uh, directed to specific topics like climate investment fund, SGG fund, agribusiness fund. And in these funds, we have used the IFU, the DFI. DFI. Yeah, the DFI, sorry. Uh, the DFI. The Danish to, Fund for Development. Exactly. Yeah. To uh, attract uh, private capital, pension funds, and institutional investors. And we have actually uh, succeeded in this. There's some Danish pension funds that are making investments in, in, Africa, in Africa, if I'm correct, yes, right? Yes, yes. I guess they also had the same uh, the idea? experience uh, when they came to Africa. And, uh, like like we really? they get out of the plane and they see the skyline of Johannesburg and say, wow, is this Africa? There are really great opportunities for investments. Uh, so so we, we work together with them, or the DFI is working right. together with uh, the pension funds. Actually, 60% of, um, of the climate investment funds capital is from uh, these uh, institutional That's investors. Amazing. Yes. So, so do you, you have a relationship with uh, the Danish Fund for Development, IFU, which is led by Tommy Thompson, right? Exactly. So Tommy Thompson in the, in, Washington, in the United States, Tommy Thompson was a beloved governor of Wisconsin. He was the head of HHS. So whenever <laughs> I've met Tommy Thompson, I say, you're not the Tommy Thompson I know. <laughs> Different but, one. <laughs> but, but Tommy Thompson, who runs IFU, in some ways reports to you as the head of the aid, of the aid ministry, right? Because are you at least pick the board members of the DFI, right? We just had a conversation where Senator Coons was talking about what's the relationship between USAID and the new, our new, uh, potentially new DFI. You, in the Danish system, that's how it works. Is that correct? That's how it works. That's how it works. And I found it very interesting what was just said by the senator. And I was thrilled if this is actually uh, coming through. Uh, because it will, I mean, it will absolutely make it possible to, 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 to invest in in, in, in big, 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 big infrastructure projects, et cetera, et cetera, what, what Africa actually need to achieve the sustainable development goals. So um, it's correct what you say. Uh, I appoint the board uh, of, the, uh, of the DFI, and uh, the DFI is working closely together with uh, the uh, uh, the specific funds. Yes. Uh, so there is a link from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the investment funds uh, through this, uh, how should I say, political leadership. We yes. have decided what kinds of uh, uh, topics the funds should be directed yes. to, like climate investment, agribusiness, and uh, also, of course, the sustainable development goals uh, as the overall uh, uh, goals that we would like to achieve. So just a couple more things, Minister, if I might. Just We've done a number of things here with, in partnership with your government on blended finance, which I know is something important to the Danish government. Uh, I also know that your, your government uh, has a, 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 a large, your strategy has a focus on youth, youth employment in developing countries, and you also have an extra focus on gender. So I'd welcome your thoughts on any of those topics, blended finance, youth, or gender, and how that relates to this conversation. I, I can assure you that the issue of gender and also the issue of youth is very high on our political uh, agenda uh, in, 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 in relation to de our development uh, policy. Um, getting back to what we're discussing here about investments and, uh, and, and, and all this, uh, the uh, DFI has actually made a partnership <coughs> with an NGO working with gender issues. Yes. So that when the DFI is investing in projects, um, they make sure that the issue of gender is taken into account. Being it uh, an infrastructure uh, project, building uh, roads or, 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 or whatever, um, it is taking into account how the gender perspective is, uh, is addressed in the overall project. And this is, I think, uh, a very good way of doing it. Um, I'm not directly involved. No, of course. Uh, but I, of course, appreciate very much that um, a political priority in our aid policy is taking into this investment. Um, this means that through partnerships, I mean, nobody can do this alone, but through partnerships, we can get two plus two, not to get four, but maybe six, eight, or 10. 
it's and great. we achieve even more by this. I would love for the other panelists, I know you've heard some really thoughtful comments. I'd love if anyone would like to just reflect on what's been said by, by other folks. I'd welcome the opportunity. Donna? I'd just like to um, quickly thank the, the minister from, uh, from Denmark and, and would love to see how we can get our U.S. pension funds together with, with, uh, with the Danish pension funds. We have worked to get the local pension funds in Africa together with U.S. funds for local resource mobilization because, as you're aware, <coughs> African pension funds currently aren't investing in infrastructure, with the exception of perhaps uh, the Government Employees Pension Fund of South Africa, the largest one. And so we're getting together for best practices and, and education. Uh, our, our pension funds in the, US, in the U.S. would be much more comfortable investing in a, a Ugandan power plant if we knew that the Ugandan pension funds were also mm -hmm. invested in that, in that project. Mm -hmm. So that's something of great interest. But we should uh, get into contact, and or I will make sure that you get into contact with our DFI because they are actually the ones yes. uh, doing all this. I'm uh, staying apart, <laughs> not involving, uh, not. Uh, I mean, I'm not the one deciding which kind of investments sh uh, they should right. invest in. Sure. And the other only thing that I would just want to add, just really quickly, is that uh, I was very happy to hear about the senator, hear the senator speaking about this new super. Uh, agency, uh, and, and I'm curious, is there going to be credit enhancement around capital market uh, transactions? Because as, as I've said before, there's a huge demand for, uh, for risk-adjusted yield from our uh, local institutional investors, but we need credit enhancement, and it would be great. Like the, the USAID bonds of old, where you wrap uh, a bond it's now full faith and credit of the U.S. government, and our U.S. institutional investors buy it all, all day long. It's minister. But I could maybe also add another example of where we are working um, quite similar, and this is uh, together with the African Development Bank, uh, where we also have uh, set up a facility uh, directed uh, towards uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in, in Africa. And uh, the idea is the same, uh, to scale up, and it's the DFI working together with the African Development Bank, uh, together with Spain as well. Uh, yeah. so, so a partnership where we are uh, focusing on, on small and medium, access to capital for small and medium-sized enterprises in Africa. Just, I just want to just come back to something that Laura Fragenti said about um, the, the, the role of the public sector and all this. I'm, you know, so I'm all for, I worked at a DFI, I've worked in investment banking, I've worked in commercial banking, but that all required having some clear rules of the game and good regulation and having functional schools and roads and an educated workforce, some of the things we've talked about here. One of the other things that, that's referenced in our video at the beginning was about taxes and, ta and, and regulation, and, but, but mainly taxes collected properly and well. And, but tax collected and spent well in public financial management. Um, the European Union has, a, I think it's um, broaden the base and spend better, I think was the European Union's uh, bumper sticker on this, um, which I think is pretty good. Um, and I think that was also part of the Addis Ababa agenda. And no one's come up with a, a sexier term than domestic resource mobilization. So if anyone's in marketing and can come up with something better than domestic resource <laughs> mobilization, I'd be really grateful. But no one's been able to figure it out. But the term domestic resource mobilization has been used as sort of a shorthand. It, it's, it's first used as taxes, but it also means all these other things. It means local savings and local capital markets, et cetera, and many things we've been talking about. But I would be interested if any of you, and Laura maybe in particular, or the minister as well, if you have some thoughts about the issue of taxes and the role of taxes and Laura, maybe I start with you, and then and then and maybe not. If you have some thoughts about this, well, I just have a, a, a general term. A better term might be establishing the foundations of successful societies. I'm, I'm going and with so that. And so that's one of I'm the, going with door one, number one. And one of the components is the tax base and looking at how you improve domestic capacity and address the technicalities of it. But well, it's one key pillar in that foundation. Well, I agree with you, Nadia. What's really interesting is when I lived in Argentina, um, only stupid people paid taxes, though. So the issue <laughs> is, is that, and I think in a lot of societies. The issue is, is that it's they, they don't have a, we have an assumed social contract. When we pay taxes, they say, look, if I pay the tax, I'm going to have cops on the street. Or if I pay tax, you're going to pay the teachers. 
or if I pay taxes, there's going to be lights or roads. So in our system, yes. And so I do agree that some of it is. And so much of the aid system, the aid conversation has been a technocratic conversation about setting up an 800 number or e-filing or this sort of thing. But there's a larger agenda about resetting the social contract. This is along the lines yeah, of what you're saying about a su I, su successful society. But Laura, I'd love for you to no, join No, I just us. want to say that part of that, uh, it's absolutely true as a general statement. But I do want to say that part of that is structural because in these emerging market economies, the share of people working in the informal sector is much, much higher. Mm -hmm. And so when you do have 75% of the people, as in many cases in Africa, uh, you know, working for the informal sector, it's much more difficult to have fiscal revenues. So how do you do? And that is a big challenge in terms of the, you know, the domestic resource mobilization. Uh, that comes from taxes that people pay. And in some cases, it's not that they don't pay it because they do not want to have a social contract with the state. Uh, they just don't pay it because the way in which to. their wage system is working for them is just doesn't have any way for them to pay it. So I think that a lot of look at how the labor market is working. And the reality is that how can we shift gradually uh, you know, a larger share of the workers from informal to formal is something that obviously would help mobilizing more resources, but also what kind of system can be put in place for the workers that are in the informal sector to actually have some saving systems that somehow on one hand build their pension and so help for their social security, but on the other hand also, uh, you know, <coughs> signal their presence as workers to the, to the government so that the government can actually collect some revenues out of them. I mean, that is a big, uh, it's a big challenge. But I do think that on this issue of domestic resource mobilization, which is, uh, you know, the big elephant in the room in a way, because a lot has been said as a result of Addis Ababa about how to mobilize resources from private sector, thinking private sector as private sector coming from other countries to invest, much less so in how to make sure that local investment or national investment stay in the countries and whatever is actually the revenues generated by national companies remains in the country or gets invested in the country. And the second, I mean, how to tap on remittances. I mean, the World Bank recently has come up with some interesting studies about uh, you know, remittances, they actually do not have a great role, uh, unlike what, though they are very big in volume, but they do not generate much growth because they are actually generally spent 90% on dependable goods. And so people go and buy, you know, a new car or a new uh, telephone or a new television, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, is there a way in which we can actually make sure that these resources actually contribute back there to these development objectives, et cetera? I think that these are all questions that uh, you know we are grappling with as a development practitioners community, and uh, uh, I think that this is what we need to try to find some way of finding common, uh, you know, answers pretty soon. Can we also come up with a better term than DRM? I'm just I'm really <laughs> asking for help here, folks. So help me out. So Minister, you had a comment, please. This is, this is a very, very important issue, and I fully agree with what just has been said, and can just add that the issue of, of, of uh, natural resources and uh, how this can also, uh, how, how the, the, the states can benefit from, from revenues from natural resources, so that all the, the resources do not just go abroad. Um, and, and that was part of the reason why I uh, dragged our, uh, Danish Minister for Taxation to Ghana uh, just a couple of months ago uh, to, to learn about how they are actually discussing uh, on constructing uh, their taxation system covering both uh, individual taxation as well as natural resources to make sure that the growth that is uh, in Ghana is, uh, is being also, I mean, used for the benefit of, of the Ghanaians and not just uh, leaving the country. Um, so, so also as minister for, or as the responsible minister for the Danish uh, ODA, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Danish taxpayers who pay the ODA, uh, mm -hmm. it's a very important issue to, to, to make sure that all what we are doing is actually uh, keeping high legitimacy amongst the Danes so we can continue to contribute with 0 
uh, in our official development aid. Mm -hmm. Well, this is great. There's just one more aspect of taxes that are that's relevant to our discussion, and that is, of course, uh, municipal bonds. Mm. Uh, you know, in the United States, we finance power, water, transportation, all all these types of infrastructure initiatives through municipal bonds. And on the continent of Africa, there's only one country that issues municipal debt, and that's South Africa. Mm -hmm. And so if the taxes could be adequately collected and then administered appropriately within the public administration, then we could issue municipal debt and finance everything and turn over money in, the own, in their immediate countries. And so that's another thing that our, our group is working on within our organization. We have many, many investment bankers and we have a, a capital markets municipal debt subcommittee. And, and I think, Donna, I think 50% of Africa is now urban today, and if it's not, it's gonna be urban in about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's like about to hit 50% in about 20 minutes, mm -hmm. and all in cities you never heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, so if we wanna deal with the urbanization challenge that's coming, I think there's a mental map in people's heads that says development is a rural conversation. Now it's still important, as my friends in Italy will tell you, rural development is important. But the conversation, we need to shift our mental maps about how we think about development to an urban conversation. That means we need competent mayors, we need uh, functioning public management, and then we need some ability to finance all that infrastructure, water, power, roads, it's electricity, all that stuff that, that's required for a functioning city to happen. And so I think this is a really important point. Look, we are running out of time. You've been a super patient audience. I'm rewarding you all with coffee and donuts out there. So I'm gonna ask you all to please join me and thank the panelists and thank you all for your flexibility. Thanks now.